Hello, welcome. Um, Eric Nelson here from TRG. Uh, we are here for our first of two webinars to talk about uh, patron engagement uh, during COVID-19. So we're going to share some insights, some tips, have a couple of provocations, um, and have room for Q&A during this session. So uh, today we're going to be focusing on the earned revenue side of growing patron engagement. And in two weeks, we will uh, meet again to talk about the contributed side. So I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Claudia Van Popperingen, who is Director of Client Services. So we are so thankful to you all for joining us today. And before we jump into things, I just wanted to say how inspiring it is to be here with you all. You know, so much so many mountains have been moved in the last six, you know, five, six months. And the work that you all are doing out there is uh, exciting and inspiring. I'm sure it can also feel exhausting at times, but just the changes that are going on and what you all are accomplishing is really, uh, like I said, so inspiring. So much so, I just wanted to share actually an email that came in this morning uh, from the executive director from the Orchestra Classique de Montreal. Uh, you know, early on in COVID, they started, like many folks, to share digital content um, through their social channels. They actually decided, actually pretty early, to really curate it. They were doing just weekly concerts uh, where they were inviting people to join. And during that time, they saw their engagement double. Uh, so, you know, having started my career uh, on the marketing side of things, um, I've been in many meetings where we've tried to brainstorm through how to get more digital engagement and, you know, coming up with things like contests and uh, polls and things of that nature, only to see the needle move a little bit, but to see digital engagement double is pretty astonishing. So this is the email he sent me this morning, which says, uh, we've moved forward with broadcasting our entire season via various paying platforms paying platforms. Tickets are already selling, so I'm thrilled that audiences are picking up on paying for online broadcasts. Glad that the surveys were correct, that people were ready to pay for online viewing. So, you know, yet another evolution in the work that we're doing together around not just putting free content out there, but actually creating journeys around paid content for patron engagement. So, uh, super inspiring there. That's a uh, both one of the provocations we're gonna be discussing today and um, one of the food for thoughts. So what are we gonna, uh, you know, what is our agenda for today's session? We are going to get to know you a little bit, uh, find out who's in the room, dive into some data. If you know anything about TRG, uh, we are data geeks and love looking at the lanterns of opportunities and challenges that present themselves in the data. So we're gonna go through that together. We've got a few tips to share. And then, like I said, there is lots of room uh, for Q&A. So speaking of that, just a few housekeeping items for the session today. Uh, so we will be using the Q&A feature. So if you have a question, please uh, put it in there. I will say that we are not going to answer questions until the very end. We've got a lot of content to get through. So we just want to make sure we have a chance to do that, but we'll make sure we get to questions at the end. And if we aren't able to get to every question, we're committed to following up with folks. So know that we'll get back to you if we aren't able to you know, get it into today's session. Speaking of the session, we are recording this. So we will send out a link with uh, you know, the way to access this later if you wanna review it um, or if you wanna share this with colleagues, we'll make that available to you as well. So um, yeah, let's get to know you a little bit. Let's find out who's joined us. So we're gonna launch just a few polls just to get a sense of uh, who's in our digital room today. So we're gonna start off with genre. What area of the arts and culture sector is represented. So yeah, you'll see a bunch of choices here. If you don't mind just clicking in, um, it's like watching the tote board fill of who we're, who's representing uh, the group today. So we'll just give it a few more moments. Uh, we're getting a lot of great participation out there. So um, I feel like if I could sing the Jeopardy theme song, I would as we count down, uh, but we have almost everyone weighing in so far. So give it just a few moments more. Survey says, great. Um, so let's see what the results are. Oh, great. So across um, the disciplines, uh, a lot of theater, 
orchestra there. That's great. Excellent. So one other, a second question, want to find out what role you play at your particular organization. So um, what, what, what role are you at? There's a few categories here of job level. So see who's joining us today. Excellent. Looks like a wide range of folks from a wide variety of, of different, you know, hats that get worn at a particular organization. So we'll give it um, just a moment more as the last ones come through. Great. Excellent. So yeah, really good representation from uh, all the different levels here. Wonderful. Thank you for doing that. And finally, what is your outlook on the future. I'm sure many of us have toggled back between optimistic and pessimistic over these last few months, uh, but would love to see, you know, what area, what strength stance do we have at this moment? How are we feeling about the future of our organizations? Excellent. We're almost at full uh, response here. So just a few more moments and then we'll see. Great, I think we are just, so lots of confidence there, somewhat confident. So, uh, and uh, kudos to the very confident, but you know, as, as we lead our patrons through all of these changes and new product offerings, you know, leading with a place of confidence is so important. But we also understand, want to understand where the challenge points are so we can help, you know, think through how to, you know, get more confidence into our businesses. So great. Thank you so much. Um, very good. So if you're joining us or learning about TRG for the first time, um, who are we? So Claudia, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm so glad to see that confidence, um, that confidence that everyone is having as well. And for those of you who maybe are slightly more concerned, uh, today's session might bring you some, some added confidence. So uh, thank you for joining us. We're so glad you all are here. Um, and so for those of you who are not familiar, as Eric mentioned, we are a data-driven consulting firm with our headquarters in Colorado. We work with arts and cultural organizations across the globe, with a focus on building sustainable patron growth and revenues. Consulting is at the core of our business. And in addition to teaching, we utilize a suite of analytics through our data center services and operate more than 20 community networks. So with a focus on building and strengthening a resilient arts and culture sector, patron loyalty is at the core of what we do. Um, and the reason is the math. Um, as loyalty increases, the cost to manage those relationships decreases. So here's a great example um, that demonstrates what this means in arts and culture. Here you see a single ticket buyer brings in about $54, the cost of sale is 20%, and they have a renewal rate of 23%. When we move into the next column, you can see that while it may cost a bit more to bring in a new subscriber, the renewal rate doubles, and when they come back or become donors, the cost of sale drops to 3%. This is why loyalty matters. And this is the math. Um, that's a great example of demonstrating that. This quote uh, from Fred Reichelt states that responding to financials in a crisis is not going to be enough. Uh, what is perhaps more important is the relationships that you build. Um, and so in this next quote, um, I love what you do now, how you treat your patrons and employees will be what everyone remembers after the COVID-19 crisis recedes. So Eric, what should arts and cultural organizations be doing today to address patron engagement? Yeah, so, you know, as we, I think I've all noticed the game keeps changing. So in arts and culture, we're used to having to climb the chutes and ladders. We make some strides and, and, you know, pick up further engagement. And then we have to, you know, deal with the fact that we lose patrons every year. But this game has gotten even harder, it feels like, especially when our patrons are at home and, you know, getting them out of, uh, you know, quarantine is, is not the right thing for many states and cities at this point. So how do we deal with these new games that we have to play and understanding what the rules are. So we would look to the data. 
what does the data tell us? How can we see, uh, we call them the lanterns of opportunity and challenges that we can apply to help uh, you know, build our strategies for further patron engagement. So the good news is on, you know, in the arts and culture sector, we are so good at collecting data. We're good at analyzing data. So oftentimes we get asked, hey, can you help us see into the crystal ball of where the future is going for patron engagement during COVID-19? And well, we all don't have crystal balls. We uh, have enough data to help make sure we don't have to guess where the P is under you know, the walnut shell. Let's look into the data to see what's happening. So first off, this probably is not going to surprise a lot of folks, but early on, we want to understand what were the changes in patron habits um, as COVID set in. And, you know, not a surprise. Lots of people turn to online streaming, uh, snacking on information and snacking on culture in higher ways than we had anticipated. So many uh, folks out there we're learning new things online, visiting museums, watching shows at numbers that were, like I mentioned at the front end, quite, a, quite astonishing how many people were doing this. Um, we also want to put that in context of people's attitudes against wanting to return. So this is information that Google has been sharing. They've been tracking the optimism of patrons wanting to come back into our venues. And this was a recent update to the study that they shared that actually showed that some pessimism is actually creeping back into patrons. Uh, early on in April, we saw that people, you know, in that red section, uh, you know, more than 50% of people were apprehensive about going back. That went down a bit and now it is uh, creeping back up. So we as marketers need to deal with um, you know, this mindset. Also, what would it take to bring folks back? So also from Google here, um, you know, I once folks reopen, I'm gonna wait a few months to see how things are. This is actually a bit of a change. A lot of the early studies show that people wouldn't come back unless there was a vaccine in place. And as you see here in the second data point, it's still really important, but, you know, seeing how things are make will make a big difference. And how people will contextualize that is, um, you know, has our venue, have we taken the steps to provide the right kind of safety, sanitation, health? You'll see that here as the top, you know, um, message point that people want to understand in order to come back. The other thing is that's starting to creep up is the need to have financial stability. So, you know, with the way we see our economies changing, uh, finance is an important piece of the puzzle for our patrons. So also, you know, what, who is our patrons of today? Do we, has our, um, our pool of opportunity changed? So a reason to be optimistic, this is from the culture track study that recently came out, uh, and I won't read all of this slide, but on the top line you see here with the circles, cultural organizations, the red circles here, indicate people who are consuming, snacking on this information, this digital content that they're putting out there, who haven't been to these organizations or type of organization before. So our opportunity for engaging with new people is growing because they're seeking and finding us. But also, what, when we can open back up again, what do people want to do the most? So also from Culture Track here, uh, probably not a surprise, the top thing is they want to get back together with loved ones, uh, want to be with friends and family, go back out to bars and restaurants. Uh, culture, while well, on this list, is a little bit lower down. So understanding the mentality of our patrons and what they're going to want to do um, gives us an opportunity to think, can we, you know, how do we position coming back with, you know, recapturing that connection with friends and family that they're looking for. Uh, one other thing from the culture track study that was really interesting to us is, you know, what are they looking for in the type of programming? So as we talk with the industry, with our clients um, about getting new product out there, digital content, one of the things we hear a lot is, you know, I may not want to do digital content because I can't provide, I don't have the budget, the resources, to do the kind of high level production value that the Berlin Phil does. So we're gonna wait until you know, we can, or maybe that's not the right fit for us. What's interesting here um, in this particular, these data points is if you see, especially in the blue column, 
you know, 24% want to see the support of local artists. They want to see their local community highlighted in things. So while we may not have the budgets to be the Berlin Phil, what we do have is a whole bunch of things that make us unique. Our community angle, our artists, thinking about uh, highlighting those folks in our digital content and our offerings because that's what's resonating with patrons. So what are we seeing in the behavioral data? So early on in COVID, uh, we started the COVID-19 International Benchmark to help quantify the impact of COVID on engagement, on our revenues. So we partnered with um, our collaborator, Purple7, to help create a way to capture this information and make it available to the sector. I will say this is a free tool. Anyone can join it, uh, look, see their data, um, you know, uh, presented back so uh, you can get the sense of how your organization is performing versus everybody else in the benchmark. And we've got some information at the end on how to join if you're interested in doing that. But how does it work and what are we learning from it? So uh, the reasons why. One, it helps us understand the impact, as we mentioned. The benchmark also helps organizations see where their data their results, their trends are comparing back to the larger data set so they can see, ooh, are we overperforming in some places? Are we underperforming? Where and why? Also, uh, we found that uh, the advocacy sector has uh, found this information really helpful to make the right kind of pitches for you know, governmental funding, local funding, things of that nature. So it's getting shared in even bigger ways. Um, advanced, we can see you know, where sales are coming from for future performances we put on sale. It covers an international scope, the US, Canada, um, and Ireland and the UK. And it helps us see just a wide range of impact of where things um, are happening and what the trends are. So what do we early, early learn from looking at this benchmark data? First, probably this isn't gonna be a surprise to folks out there is we in arts and culture are really good at bringing patrons in. Where we struggle often is those paths of retention as Claudia pointed out in the math there, getting people on the path and getting them to have deeper engagement is important. It's hard work to do. So looking at you know, revenue and engagement from ticketing in 2018, how many of those people we held on to in 2019? In the UK, 33% of our ticket buyers stayed with us from 18 to 19. In the US, uh, 46%. So we bring in a lot of people, but we turn through a whole lot of them at the same time. So in the benchmark, you can start to see, we can start to see how we're comparing, how organizations are comparing to the larger, larger data set. So, just a quick overview. The dotted line here shows that particular organization who we're looking at here. So one organization, uh, their sales uh, from 2019. The solid gold bar shows their sales for 2020. And the green line shows uh, the whole aggregate data set. So everyone who's participating, uh, what their sales are for 2020. So you can see this particular organization is actually, you know, a little ahead of the overall trend. So that would help us to lead or think about why is that happening and what can we, what can we learn from that? Uh, we can also look on this on a week by week basis so you can see where the changes are happening. But it gives us you know, aggregate data so we can start to quantify for the industry as a whole. So this shows number of tickets sold in the US and Canada and uh, UK and, the, and Ireland uh, from January into July. So for both you see you know, in January, February, at least in, in the US and Canada, we were actually, you know, tracking ahead of sales, a uh, number of tickets sold, uh, 2019, uh, UK and Ireland, similar. Um, and then as March happens, we start to see the fall off and even more continued fall off as we get into the summer months, similar stats all around. These probably are not going to surprise you. It's in your own shops. Same data, but through the lens of revenue. Again, we were trending well, actually off to really strong 2020s. And then uh, once COVID hit, we really started to see the fall off in, in the revenue trending. You do see though, people are still purchasing even June, July. Uh, some organizations are still selling subscriptions into the new year. Some programming has opened up and become available. Not a lot, but people are and will still buy. 
revenue we're also getting is from uh, the way we've led uh, all of you out there, patrons to think about how to use canceled performance revenue in different ways. So Spectrix, our friends created uh, the ticket converter tool. Uh, organizations can use this to help quantify um, what happened to revenue from canceled performances? How much of it was refunded back? How much was kept by the organization for rescheduled performance? Where was it credited back? Uh, how much was donated back? We saw on average about 63% of revenue was held onto for canceled performances. I've heard upwards of 70, even 80% for some organizations. I think this tool is still available so you could contact Spectrix if you'd like to have it to tracker um, used at your organization as well. So top line trends, you know, those fall offs in sales and in ticketing, but actually if we dig deeper, we can start to find out where there are some optimistic points and where there are some challenging points within who's buying. So let's dig into some segmentation about who's participating. So this is the structure we use to describe who's buying, a segmentation analysis perspective. So new customers, once befores, people who are converts, actives, you see all of these categories here. What you'll also notice is that we purposely had these transcend uh, revenue stream categories like subscription or single ticket buyer. Those are important lenses in which to view the data, but not everybody has all of the same types of product line categories. So we use this segmentation vernacular to help transcend that, to really articulate across a wide range of organizations where loyalty lives. So for example, super actives and actives, people who are returning, coming back with great frequency versus new buyers. And we've got folks like lapsed and stale in there as well. So what's going on with these folks? Are they participating? And if so, at what rates? So to give us an insight, we first looked at US and Canada for the first seven months of 2019. This was the mix of buyers who bought last year. So probably not a surprise, our super actives are, you know, as they do, raising their hands and participating. Uh, but lots of new customers here, as we saw in those earlier slides, were bringing in, as we typically do, uh, new folks into the mix. So how did this differ from 2020? So what do you see here? I'm gonna to toggle back and forth through this. You see this blue, the super actives, the percentage of participation grows dramatically. And at the same time, we see new customers down from, proportion, from proportionality down 33%. And this is a, you know, for all kinds of reasons, a red flag to us because our new customers are what? They're the pipeline, they fuel um, our business, not only for today, but they get on these loyalty journeys for tomorrow. And if we're not getting enough new buyers in, um, we're not filling that pipeline to help set us up for success in the future. And I know many of you are thinking, of course, we have no product out there. How could we? Our provocation, one of the things we're going to talk about in today's uh, webinar is what we can and might and should do to have offerings out there to bring new customers in. Same data for the UK and Ireland. Uh, this is the same, you know, what we saw first in 2019. And then what happened in 2020? Actually more stability, uh, holding on to that percentage of new customers coming through the door. Interesting finding there. Um, so what's happening over the summer? Have things collapsed? Where are we seeing people buy? So we wanted to compare the same segmentation analysis from June and July in 2019 to uh, June and July 2020. This is the US and Canada. So even more so of uh, that percentage of new buyers filling our pipeline down significantly, actually down almost you know, 75% um, in, these, in the first two months of summer than what we've seen um, historically. In the UK and Ireland, 2019, seeing again, you know, equal some you know, distribution across the board, but uh, more so new customers not holding steady as much in June and July. So we're actually down 12% of filling those new pipelines uh, over the summer. So as we look to the future, you know, we know our, for many organizations, our seasons open in the fall, our new gallery uh, 
presentations, exhibitions tend to happen in the fall. Um, what do we typically count on for participation in the months from August into December, into the end of the year? Lots of new customers, as you see here, 46% in the US and Canada. Um, in UK and Ireland, 44%. Obviously, we don't have the stat yet for 2020, but knowing that a lot of heavy lifting happens with new patronage in uh, the last, you know, five, six months of the year, uh, it's important to think about how we're putting strategies in place to keep that pipeline full. So it also gets a little more, you know, uh, you know, pessimistic, uh, uh, you know, challenging stats as we look at shifts in population patterns. So how do we take some of this pessimism that we see coming and turn it into opportunities for us? So we see that, you know, these groups listed here are typically the most, the largest percents of our data sets who are buying and are patrons with us. So as we see shifts uh, happen, especially here, you know, within the next 10 years, baby boomers and silent generation will decrease from our population substantially. Are we finding ways to not only get new buyers in the door, but hold on to them and be relevant to the changes in what our populations look like? How do we, you know, appeal to who our communities are made up of? and find welcoming ways to bring them in. So just a couple more data points to share with you all. Um, we actually asked, uh, you know, as, as we collect data in the benchmark, it's not just ticketing data, we also look at donation data. So our next webinar in two weeks, we'll dig deeper into this, but we wanted to see who's actually been participating from a segment perspective in January through June from a contribution standpoint, gifts under 100K. And what do we see here? New customers, again, playing a big role in helping to, um, you know, fill, uh, achieve our contributed revenue goals. So again, it's a theme we're going to keep revisiting. What happens when we don't have new customers coming in the door? Further on down the line, we're, we're going to see further challenges if we aren't beginning to address this. Same thing in the UK and Ireland, new customers playing a big role there. While their you know, percentages are down, it's still a significant portion of folks who are participating. So we must get strategic. Um, you know, as Claudia pointed out, Fred Reichheld said to us, you know, the creator of the net promoter system, um, you know, what we do today is what people will remember. So the types of offerings, the messages, the programming, we want to keep our patrons engaged and um, let them know we're thinking in new and creative ways. And with that in mind, we need to get out of our box that we are in an in intermission at this moment. I understand the reason behind this messaging, but we're gonna talk in some examples of how we can actually change the narrative a bit and get out of intermission and into active patron engagement during this time. So with that, we're going to jump into our top tips. Um, we've got five of them for you today, and I'm going to start us off with the first one, which is segmented and targeted communications. Um, what we say and how we say it really does matter. Uh, the points on this slide should not surprise you. Uh, we want to make sure we're having clear communication, acknowledging the patron and their relationship with your organization is so important. Offer options relative to that patron's loyalty and keep a record of their choices in your CRM. COVID has challenged us in many ways as a sector um, and digital has become an effective way of engaging with our patrons, new and old alike. And so we must remember this. It starts with your digital front door. Because so much of your web traffic is from people new to your site, it's critical that they can find the information they need quickly and efficiently. So think about your own website. Is it welcoming? Would it be overwhelming, perhaps, to somebody who's not familiar with your organization? Would they get a sense of your organization's personality? Is the information up to date? So in this example of Alvin Ailey's website, um, it's refreshing. Yes, there is lots of information that you can get to on their website. But when I first visit, I'm not overwhelmed. Instead, I'm greeted with stunning imagery and clear action steps that I can take. On this next example uh, from the Citadel Theater, 
It brings me right to the information I'm likely seeking, uh, answers to my questions and information about their reopening plans. So each patient has different needs and will need different information when it comes to your communications, but all patrons need you to relate to them. As we mentioned earlier, you should know how your patrons have engaged with your organization. So be sure to acknowledge that relationship and context in your messaging. You'll want to describe the updates that impact them and articulate their options and next steps. Here are some examples for varying segments and situations. Uh, you might uh, want to be stewarding your actives towards a donation or encouraging a repeat experience for those who have come once before. Or maybe you are welcoming your lapsed buyers to come back for a new experience. Your communication should have a positive and hopeful tone. Um, and as I've said before, be sure to record their transaction uh, in your CRM. So here are some uh, examples of confident and optimistic communications. Uh, this first image here from the Royal Winnipeg Ballet, stating simply and clearly, we are here to help. Uh, not much else to say, but now I feel supported. Everyman Theater, this was uh, from the end of their 1920 season when some of their performances were canceled. They describe many options for their subscribers, but what they don't focus on here are refunds and returns. And this tactic, in fact, allowed them to retain 88% of revenue, uh, which, is, which is fantastic. Um, and then this last example here, uh, this organization had to cancel their in-person performance, like many of you, I'm sure, experienced, but they followed up with an opportunity to still listen to a performance from the artist's home. In this next example, Toronto Symphony, uh, they reached out to specific donors uh, with special messages um, and performances, and they asked for feedback. Um, they want to hear from their patrons so they can create experiences they value. Um, so that's an important piece. But wait, there's always something we forget about. Um, and the question that I have is, are you still listing on benefits on your website that relate to experiences that unfortunately aren't happening right now? This example is not of arts and culture, but you might have similar benefits that are no longer relevant, like uh, in-person meet and greet or a post-show champagne toast. Um, we know benefits can help encourage patrons to donate or purchase subscriptions and memberships. So if you have engagements tied to specific benefits, check to see that they are relevant to today's environment and that your website is current. Yeah, Claudia, it's interesting. I, uh, as I was thinking about this presentation, I did a sort of view uh, review of a number of different uh, arts and culture sites, and I can't tell you how many I found that said in the donor benefits. I know we're talking about uh, earned revenue today, but you know the messaging we put out there to even our contributed revenue patrons is all part of this mix. So how many sites still say, join us on September 23rd for a glass of champagne in the patrons lounge for our opening night, fill in the blank, when a different part of our website says that performance or that uh, exhibition is canceled. So make sure the through lines of our messaging are clear. It shows the care that we've taken uh, for and with our patrons. Thanks, so um, that leads to, you know, that, that care is a path of loyalty for our patrons. So, you know, our, the name of the game with engagement is journeys and creating and welcoming patrons into our family in a, such a way that has consistency and that they're showing up um, on an ongoing basis as a member of that family. So there's, you know, many of the tenants that we're used to using, we should still be doing, uh, you know, mapping out our plans of loyalty, who's getting what offers when, that we're being thoughtful around creating, you know, ongoing uh, engagement throughout the year so patrons are coming back. All this muscle memory that you all out there know so well, we need to keep doing that and we need to add and dress it up with some of the new realities of COVID. So know who we're engaging uh, think about some of the new logistics in that plan, uh, define your touch points, and use your tools. Um, and also, this is, you know, it can feel 
a bit overwhelming because there's so much more that we have to think about, but also gives us this opportunity on the optimistic side to say, hey, what are all those things about our engagement plan that we always wished we could do differently? If we could start over, we could have, as uh, our CEO, Joe Robinson has said, um, an evolution to revolution. Let's change uh, what's happening with our organizations so we can evolve to have new and interesting ways. So one, and I want to give a shout out to our colleague, uh, Brad Carlin, who helped uh, with the thinking around these strategies. But first, as we see in the data, um, people are still buying. Actually, who's, people are buying into the future as we have programs um, opportunities still on sale on our sites. It's mostly our nearest and dearest. It's probably not a surprise to learn that people with at least three uh, attendances with us in the last 18 months are still purchasing. They want us to be around. They want to have something to look forward to. Um, so many of us though are saying to our patrons, you know, keep calm, hang with us. We're going to know soon what we're going to be offering, but they will only hang for so long. So we need to start uh, presenting, letting them know what the paths of engagement will be uh, because they will get distracted and start thinking in different ways. I can't tell you how many organizations I've spoken with who have said to me, oh yeah, we still have our season listed on our website. We know we're not gonna be presenting it that way, but we're not ready yet to release that information, but our patrons are still seeing that. So be thoughtful about putting the right journey out there, describe it as soon as you can. So we're not, you know, leading our patrons astray into thinking about journeys that aren't going to be available to us because that will help, you know, move them along from not wanting to hang with us. We want to keep them around. So with that in mind, know who you're engaging, you know, in your plans of loyalty building, you probably typically look at transactional segments, you know, single ticket buyers versus subscribers and trying to get them to come back based on that behavior, having special invitations and offers for them that way. You also can fold in behavioral segments as we saw in some of the uh, segmentation that we queued up earlier in the analysis. So you've got all of that to think about and you need to be thinking about the layers that have been added because of COVID. Who in these mixes are turn back donors uh, that we have to now manage that relationship in a different way because we said, well, yeah, if you donate your ticket back, we're gonna do this for you. Or if there's credits on account, how do we queue up to that person to say, hey, you can use that money you have with us. So make sure you're layering in that message. We've created deals with our patrons as we you know, thought through um, canceled performances. Now we may have to make good on those deals and be thoughtful about that. Uh, we also need to think about these new levels of um, access points, how people will be buying through new levels of engagement. You know, if we're going digital, is it free? Is it paid? Is it recorded? Is it live? What are all these pieces of the puzzle? So make sure you're mapping all of these um, elements out so you both are aware of it internally and that you're taking your patrons by the hand through it as you're presenting it back to them. We know from research that uh, the main time when someone makes a decision if they're gonna come back or not, first timer, is not after a performance, but it's typically when they sit down in their seat or they show up for that exhibition. Early on, do they have problems with the logistics of getting there? So we have a whole new set of logistics that we need to be describing to our patrons and taking them by the hand through. So we want to make sure we're doing that and being thoughtful. And uh, we have these new opportunities to provide ways to create repeat um, stickiness, love with us. We often call it surprise and delight. So as a first time ticket buyer, I may show up at a venue, they, my tickets get scanned and the usher or uh, you know welcoming team member might say, oh my gosh, Mr. Nelson, welcome for the first time. Um, here's a drink voucher for you just to say thank you. Um, we can need to and should be using these kind of tools and tactics, stewardship tools and tactics, um, surprise and delight tools and tactics, um, in this, you know, the digital experiences that we're doing today. So map all those out, uh, think through how you can curate that experience in the ways we have done in person, mimic that back, um, you know, in the digital sphere. Our patrons will thank us for it and it creates that on rent to stickiness. 
So welcoming, retaining, elongation, the name of the game is still the same. We wanna create frequency and frequency that creates some love with us. But we also, uh, thinking back to what patrons need today, um, programming messaging that's also relevant to the needs they have today. If you haven't read this book, The Art of Relevance by Nina Simon, I highly recommend it. It's a wonderful insight um, and playbook for how to think through messaging, being thoughtful about having true uh, commitment to relevance as we welcome new patrons and existing ones uh, into our doors. And just a couple of things that we don't wanna forget, uh, palate cleansers perhaps, if you will, but mail, direct mail, why not send out a postcard for our streamed performances. Um, I've heard San Diego Rep, uh, I believe used a postcard to sell one of their streaming performances with Hershey Felder. That performance sold at $50 a stream, made tens of thousands of dollars. Don't forget about our traditional ch you know, channels when we're marketing and trying to engage patrons. You know, There's not a lot of mail going out right now, so it can uh, cut through the clutter. Also phone. Uh, we're hearing about really high rates of contact rates uh, from our friends in the telemarketing world. So use the phone, uh, call your patrons. It doesn't have to be all about sales. It can also be just checking in with them as well. But these tools that we've had for a long time aren't getting used as much as they used to. So let's introduce them back in, create those palate cleansers of different ways to hear from us than just email and social. Yeah, so those last two points, Eric, um, data collection, right? So yeah, indeed. Phone calls, you need to have that data, which um, is something that we're used to. And we, uh, most of us have a well-oiled machine around collecting data to make those efforts possible in our pre-COVID world. Um, but then there's the digital offering. So um, we're reaching more patrons with digital offerings today. Um, and data collection for that must also be happening. Um, we have lots of ways to do that, um, but it's different than perhaps we've known before. Digital engagements have taken off. Uh, people are listening, they're watching online, and these offerings are happening. This is just a few uh, examples of Symphony, uh, Symphony friends here. And a wide range of audiences are attending these digital offerings. Um, typically, this uh, when we ask an organization who's attending your digital offerings, they they tell us excitedly that they've had attendees from New Zealand. For some reason, this is the country that tends to get highlighted, um, and this is great news. And the wide geographic reach is something new and exciting for many of us. But when we ask who that person is, often the response is, "I I don't I don't know I don't know who that is." Um, so the challenge we find ourselves in is that uh, we need to find out who's engaging in our content and our offerings. Um, why? So you can invite them back and bring them on your loyalty pathway. There are many ways to capture attendee data for events that you might not be charging for. Uh, so from RSVP uh, systems to surveys, uh, perhaps implementing data paywalls, whatever your method might be. Uh, being sure to upload that data into your CRM so that you can reach back out to them. In this example uh, from our friends at Pitt Lockery in the UK, they're inviting you to a book club, a uh, book club but for plays. And uh, note here at the bottom that in order to receive the session link, uh, they ask that you opt into their email list. Uh, this is a great uh, way to capture data uh, for folks. Data collection is often just thought of as names and addresses, as I mentioned, or transactional information, uh, but we also want to collect patron feedback. So in a recent pilot program that TRG launched in partnership with Fred Reichelt, a cohort of six theaters are regularly launching patron surveys, followed by evaluating the feedback and connecting back with patrons. So there are clear action, action steps that the organization uh, can take to what we call uh, or what Fred Reichheld calls closing the loop. So listening is always important, but especially now. Uh, you need to know, are your new digital offerings being valued? What could be improved upon? It's a chance to connect with your patrons in a world where, let's be honest, connection is different than before. Um, listening, but also taking action. So challenge yourself, your organization to be nimble, and to be relevant to your patrons, as Eric mentioned earlier. 
Um, and just tying back to something we said earlier, that's the relationships that you build, which will ultimately fortify your revenues. Indeed, yeah, and Claudia, it's interesting, I love, you know, as, as you heard at the beginning at TRG, we love data. Uh, we have our data hats on firmly and securely. Um, and collecting data, you know, there's so much out there, so much available. And while it's great and there's so much to learn from Google Analytic data, getting actual, you know, information of who is attending, who the specifics are, we need to take that step up to go um, and amplify or add to that Google Analytic data with finding out who and the why. So that's where, you know, the survey data that you're talking about are asking people to RSVP and, uh, you know, respond is so important and helpful because it does feed those next steps, indeed. Um, so, you know, for, we're thinking about our paths of loyalty, we're finding out who's participating, uh, we have to have something to sell them. So how do we, you know, fill our shelves? Uh, new packaging, new pricing, you know, all of a sudden our, you know, channels of distribution have grown and changed dramatically. The ways that we can interact with our patrons have grown and changed dramatically. It can feel overwhelming to, you know, have the work that you know we as marketers do to sort of exponentially grow because we now have all these new opportunities. So we need to be thoughtful though. What, what is the new packaging and pricing structures of today? So uh, from our perspective, you heard it early on, it includes digital. Shuffling digital into our loyalty plan that it's part of the path of engagement is a, a really important step we would recommend that you take. It's not just the, the venue plan versus the digital plan, bringing it all together. It has a price tag. Um, as you heard me say with that reference earlier uh, with the Orchestra Classique de Montreal, you know, people will pay and are willing to do that. We also have to have it address all of our realities. There's a lot going on and I've got some interesting examples for you to think about. And this is a chance for us to pull down the silos and come together with development. As we all know, that patron journey really encapsulates uh, the whole organization, but we tend to have the step siloed. Uh, but we can partner with development to make it more cohesive. And then of course, providing the safety nets for our patrons. So um, digital, what is the comeback plan? So we've been asking, surveying the industry to find out how likely are you and when uh, will you come back for in-person performances? So this is a recent study we released. It's a second version of it. So we've asked it now the second time and we're seeing shifts. So there was, uh, more people were thinking about fall in the first iteration when this came out. Now we're seeing things shift into uh, later into this year, into early 2021. Um, so, you know, as we think back to that point about filling our pipelines, uh, if we're not gonna be in our venues till, till, until later, we need to find some ways to have, you know, sales participation happen. So we had Oscar Eustace, Artistic Director of the Public Theater on our TRG 30, our weekly 30 minute session to talk through strategic ideas, tactics around the industry. And he shared this quote about the evolution of his thinking around, could our art form, could theater be done in anywhere other than live spaces together? And he evolved his thinking. He originally thought it had to be live in venues. Uh, but if you look on the website and see what the public is doing, they're doing so much digitally now uh, with this change in attitude because we can engage with patrons through the digital sphere. And how many people are thinking about paying, having that be paid? Uh, well, a lot, it looks like from this survey, especially into the late summer and early fall, uh, healthier percentages than we saw before, but still there are many out there who are delaying this or holding off. And I know there are reasons, um, you know, negotiations with unions, rights to, um, you know, copyright stuff, that is all real things. So don't hear me say that we should discount that, but we need to find ways. We have studied this many times over the years that when someone pays for something, they have more skin in the game and they come back with greater frequency. So um, having paid offerings um, can and will help with building up some of that longevity of keeping patrons around. And it's happening. So these are some theater examples. Uh, 
what people have been charging. I know there's a wide range of things out there, but this ranges from as low as $10 up to $50, $100 for American Shakespeare Center. So one of our recommendations is to think about testing prices. See where uh, you get pushback, like you do with pricing your halls and your exhibitions. You know, you test and try. See what, um, what the market can bear and know that price sends a message. Um, so get that feedback from what you're seeing in terms of what people are buying. This um, you know, brought such a big spring to my step, American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco. They, like everybody else, is dealing with when will we be back in the venue? When are we, you know, we have digital offerings. How do we, you know, know when to say when we're actually going to have a season when we don't know when we're going to have a season? Um, and dealing with that added layer of when patrons want to come back. So this plan, the all in, the anywhere, the in person, so interesting. So all in says, I'm all in with ACT. Sign me up for all shows, virtual on demand in person. I'm going to be there in every capacity. And there's a price point attached to that. Um, if you're taking the anywhere, I want access to your virtual live stuff and on demand performances. Uh, so let me know. And then maybe if you're gonna be back in venue, I'll think about that. And then this last one, in person, count me in when it's safe to come back. So that's where I see myself fit is, I wanna join when you're back in venue. So this organization has thought through the mindsets of their patrons and have met them where they are with product lines uh, that deal with that. Really smart, really cool program. Also, our friends at the Richmond Symphony, uh, they have a summer series every year, six concerts. This year, they did Beethoven, Comfort and Joy, and it was done in venue live as well as streamed and sold that way. Uh, you could pay for in venue tickets. You also paid for stream tickets. Single tickets were available. Uh, subscriptions were available. You could buy all six of these concerts as a subscription package. Super cool first that I saw, that we saw, of someone packaging up um, digital in a subscription format. And this is what it looked like. So chamber style performances, socially distanced in the venue, and this was streamed out live. They partnered um, with their local uh, you know, NPR station, uh, public media, I'm sorry, to help with the tech side of things. And I watched a number of these. The sound was great. The visuals were, were crisp and clear, um, really wonderful. And they do this series every year, not always that for sure that they're doing streaming, uh, but ticket revenue was up 313%. So uh, there's an appetite out there and an interest from patrons. And what did patrons say? They surveyed back some just great things. I'll bring these all up in terms of responses. I missed the symphony. Great to hear live performances again from local musicians. Again, we don't have to be the Berlin Phil. We can, you know, highlight our local performances. Um, I could hear better actually, um, you know, getting to see the musicians in new ways. Really cool stuff. Um, and great to see the Richmond Symphony leading this way. Another great example, Bard on the Beach. Uh, Summer Theater in Vancouver, uh, they can't be with patrons this year. So they're the first I've seen who's launched a virtual member benefit program. So you heard us talking earlier about donation benefits being outdated. They actually went and said, okay, we're gonna create our membership benefits to be all digital and virtual this year. So if you go on their website, you'll see that each of these, you click through the different dollar amounts and you see the offerings, all digital, all, um, keeping social distancing in mind for some things that they may have face-to-face, -face, but really smart. They also, as you'll see here on the left, they changed their logo, the temporary logo for the summer. So instead of being barred on the beach, they're barred beyond the beach for this summer. So um, really great, smart things of meeting donor, patrons, donors, where they are, yet still providing a business model, a framework of shelves filled with product offerings so we can keep staying vital uh, at this time. So, uh, yeah. That, that's such a great example um, for, for those of us who, you know, are not going to be reopening next month or the month after. Um, this last section is perhaps about those of us who might be thinking about reopening. Um, and what is that plan? What, how do we prepare for that? 
Um, so when the time is right, which is going to be different for, for all of us, uh, we need to make sure that our patrons feel confident with their purchases and trust that you'll provide the absolute best and safest experience for them. We can't ignore um, that, our, that our loyal patrons during the period, during this period of time, um, excuse me, we can't ignore that our loyal patrons during this time are not in the theater or not performing live. So we need to make sure that our patrons know you care and continue to value their loyalty. In this example um, from Delta, they're offering to extend member status and benefits during a time when you're likely not flying. And they make it easy. Updates will automatically be reflected in your account. In our next example uh, from Theater Royal Wakefield, um, they're letting patrons know up front that purchasing is risk-free. So is there a reason not to secure your seat? Um, if a performance does get canceled, the patron has options, which uh, here does include refunds. So as a patron, you'll be taken care of, and it's clear uh, what your options are. You'll see at the bottom there, they're highlighted, um, you know, a gift card that's valid for two years from the purchase price, uh, for the purchase price of each ticket. This next slide is from Culture Track. Um, and the good news is that we don't actually have to guess at what our patrons are looking for when deciding to return to cultural activities. Uh, we know what they are already. And since we've been in this world for, for many months, these uh, items that you will see for our new normal world are not going to be surprising. Um, but the question is what internal factors have you addressed so that when you are able to reopen, your patrons have the best experience again, what are the things that you can control um, versus the things that perhaps are not. Barrington Stage uh, provided uh, detailed information to their patrons for their upcoming live performance. And while uh, this information might seem copy heavy, uh, maybe in some marketers' minds, kind of your worst nightmare, it has the detail that their patrons wanted. Um, it offers clear information and helps to inform the customer what kind of experience they will have, um, including here you can see uh, how they've designed their seating arrangements. Um, it's, so it's important to note that even if you think you've thought of everything, uh, you will miss something, um, something that your patrons will tell you about if you ask. Um, so again, here comes in our, our listening uh, pitch that will be critical in improving uh, the patron experience. Uh, Barrington had great success with their reopening, which ended up selling out, um, and another show was added at the time that this communication was released. Um, and I think, Eric, you shared with me that now they're pivoting to outdoor uh, venue arrangements uh, as well to adapt to their local uh, uh, ordinances and, and requirements. Yeah, indeed. They were, uh, the, the, their performances, which opened on August 5th, were, meant, we're supposed to be in, actually, I will go back so we can just look at it for a second, you know, in this venue style format with uh, socially distanced seating. Uh, but because Massachusetts uh, actually slowed down their plan of reopen, uh, because we all have to be nimble in the arts, they uh, quickly got together and moved that performance outdoors. So they did not cancel, uh, but they created, you know, with tents a venue outside and have, um, have presented that, had a run of their first show. Um, so, you know, what's interesting here is, again, going back to some of that research about when people will show up and be interested in coming back, vaccine was so high on the list of a must have, and they're selling tickets even without a vaccine being in place, but they've shown this care of taking care of their patrons by thinking through, as Claudia, you just pointed out, all of the, all, all the moments that I would be concerned about as a patron um, when coming back into a venue or an outdoor space. <laughs> so this last example we have does this, does this well. Um, this is an example of a movie theater in Texas that uh, has thorough descriptions of their reopening plan. Um, so they cover the changes a customer might experience when purchasing a ticket, when buying concessions or other food, and how they are managing social distancing. Um, we love that they have videos that let you see just exactly how you'll interact with their space and what seating will look like. Um, and this is a great way to make your customers feel confident in their experience. You can imagine somebody who has been coming to your theater for many, many years um, and it's time to come back and they're ready and, and, want, and willing. 
And this is a nice way for them to, to get a preview um, so that they, they feel prepared um, as they enter. So these are just a few examples that help demonstrate what an exceptional customer experience uh, could be and how that can lead to continued patron loyalty. Um, and that's gonna be the conclusion of our, of our uh, content for today. We're gonna move into questions. And Eric, uh, I know you've maybe had a second to glance at what has been coming in, uh, so. Yeah, indeed. So thank you so much, uh, Claudia and everyone out there for submitting questions. We're going to dig into the Q&A portion. We, uh, we heard as we were putting these webinars together that people wanted to have time to really ask questions and dig through some thoughts and ideas, and we'll get to that. One thing I just wanted to wrap up just this journey and the piece of the puzzle around patron engagement is it's a stat that you all know very well, but I think is worth revisiting and thinking about is we we think of our databases, oftentimes we know everyone can tell us, oh, we've been around for 50 years. We have 50 years of data of our patrons. And when we've studied the data, we look at data sets sort of in a six year window um, for a couple of reasons. One is there's active patrons and then there's patrons who could be active with us again. And then there's some who have, are never coming back again. And we find that in that six years, patrons who participate with us in a 24 uh, month period are much more likely to come back. So um, it's they they still can churn up, but the response rates are higher. When they get into that three to six year window, it becomes really hard to get them to come back. And after six years, they you know it's like falling off a cliff in terms of getting them back. So you're hearing us talk a lot about the need for journeys and engaging people with a product because. If we get too far, even though as much as our patrons want us back, if we get too far away from transactional relationships with patrons with us, the likelihood of getting them back, we've seen in the data, you know, this is such a unique year and experience, but the farther we get away from true, uh, the harder it will be to get people to come back. So we're just really thoughtful and bullish about the need to be thinking in those ways. So those new customer segments, you know, as hard as it will be, we need to not have them shit, um, you know, shift down so much and shrink down so much. So with that in mind, questions are coming in. So first one up here is, um, you know, do you think it's a good idea to make our live stream concerts available to anyone or exclusively to uh, our subscribers? We're concerned about alienating subscribers. We wanna make them feel special. And we wanna give them something exclusive, but we also wanna make money. Uh, should we be focusing on the regional orchestra? Should we use this as an opportunity to expand our audience base to the geographic regions, perhaps getting some of those New Zealanders into our mix? Um, and there's the fear that we may start competing with other orchestras in other geographic areas. Um, you know, so what are the thoughts about that? So let's sort of break that up into pieces. So this first one here about, um, you know, should we make it available, our live stream concerts, to everyone or just subscribers? Um, and Claudia, I have a very specific point of view of this, but I will uh, toss it to you first to, you know, hear your thoughts on, you know, the, the variety within the mix. Sure, so this question um, links into quite a few different points that we talked about today. Um, and I think about, you know, what is the, what are the engagements that you have available for your patrons? Um, so that you can start to map out what that might look like for your subscribers versus um, those who perhaps uh, don't have a monetary investment with you just yet. Um, because it can be both, right? You might have um, a pre uh, first exclusive offering for your subscribers that then gets um, uh, promoted to, to others that you're talking with. Um, so I think there's a couple ways that you might think about that, um, but certainly uh, it doesn't need to be just ex as subscribers uh, with your offerings. Indeed, yeah, I agree. Like, so, you know, I think it's an interesting exercise to actually take a step back internally. It's a great way to collaborate between marketing and artistic and executive teams to think about what are all of our digital offerings and which ones here are for new, buy, new people like w that we would be using to attract and introduce our organization to new people. So that's a very different offering. It has different welcoming messaging when the, when you're, uh, putting it out there versus this is the 
kind of streaming or, or digital content that's for um, welcoming pack people who know us really well. So it, it's actually, it's an interesting exercise and I think a really fun one uh, to think about how we program for loyalty and what, and you can, it doesn't have to be all, it's yes and because there are different journeys at organizations. Um, though at the same time, we know that exclusiveness, access to further programming are loyalty uh, fulcrums. So we want to be using those. Uh, you can say things like, you know, after every concert, the artists do an encore that we, that is streamed just for our subscribers. So if you want to get the encore, sign up to subscribe today. So um, create those levels, those, those stair steps of it, the engagement process with your content. Um, so the other part too of this is the regional perspective. Um, you know, how do we, should we, how do, you know, be welcoming, thinking about um, expanding our footprint. Um, you know, it's, we, it's interesting, we, you know, Claudia mentioned, we run uh, community networks all over the United States in 25 different cities. Um, and we, so we can see the behavior within patrons who are active with more than one arts organization. And there's always the concern that there's going to be cannibalization, like if that patron who's a symphony patron finds out there's an opera in town, they're not going to stay with us in the symphony. We actually see the opposite they actually will add on. Arts mavens get created. They also know that you're out there. So you can try to hide it, but they're gonna figure it out. So my recommendation is welcome new patrons, try to build a repeat performance, repeat frequency with them and test it, monitor, see where the frequency is happening and lean into that. Use your data to figure out Okay, did they just, were, were they just info snacking and saw us one time or through welcoming them back, did they come multiple times? Claudia, would you add to? Yeah, well, this makes me think of the data collection piece, right? So if you are expanding geographically, um, fantastic. Um, again, don't be afraid of that, uh, but how can you make sure that you're collecting that person's data so that you can do exactly what Eric uh, just described? Um, you know, continue to track their behavior and understand uh, maybe they will become just as loyal uh, as your as your subscribers um, or other more traditional uh, loyalty pathways. Indeed. So let's move on. Next question. Um, we do live presentations, but the sound picture quality doesn't warrant payment. We can't guarantee the consistency of quality and we can't afford to do it ourselves. Do you have any sense of how these organizations are paying to produce quality live streams. Um, well, I'll just jump in. I know Richmond Symphony, you maybe heard me say, they partnered with someone who knew how to do that work. So they were able to bring the content to the table. Their partner was able to bring in the digital know-how. Um, there was learning all across the board, so I don't want to diminish that. They definitely had to learn to collaborate together on it. But you, know, you don't have to do this alone. Partnerships are a great way to think about it. And that and um, this, I think, was one of the Richmond learnings, but I think it expands and can, uh, you know, apply in all kinds of different cities, locations, uh, genres, is our sponsors. Our sponsors, you know, they've, they've sponsored our in-venue performances. Digital is a way to think about reframing the sponsorship conversation. Perhaps there are folks who would help pay for this for you if they get sponsorship uh, mentions, things of that nature. So be creative, think about partnering with organizations, you know, look to your, um, who's helped support you and amplified your message would be my recommendation. That's great, Eric. I don't, I wouldn't add anything uh, beyond that, uh, except to say, just remember there's, there's other content beyond just uh, live streaming, a pro live streaming and performance uh, that could still warrant an investment. So uh, don't be afraid to think about other other options. Indeed, yeah. The, I I love that research point about the local perspective trumping, um, you know, all kinds of bells and whistles in terms of production value. Um, it didn't say that exactly, but the, the, the highness on the list of local, that's, that's a really important you know, um, position of strength that you have that appeals to your patrons. 
Okay, um, next question. I saw something on an earlier slide about sharing survey results with audiences. Do you have any examples of an organization that has done this really well? I'd love to reassure people uh, that we're using their data to inform decisions. Um, I think just that, I mean, that's a great, you know, that, that need there. And, you know, we, as, as data focused as we are, we're also, you know, really mindful of privacy, GDPR, uh, needs and the guardrails that need to be put around data. Um, so using it in a way to say, you know, I love the family metaphor that our industry takes, right? You know, peop our patrons are part of our family. So this is an interesting time to be transparent, share with them the decision making process, why we're doing things, and why not have our whys behind our motivations be informed by the data and the analysis that we're doing. So I think it, in a way with guardrails, share the why, share your, that, the research behind uh, the tactics that you're taking. Claudia, you live in the data world uh, all the time at TRG. Um, concerns or other points you would help us think about to make sure there's safety or, and or you know, other answers to these questions? Yeah, I think you know, it's, um transparency builds a different sense of trust right with you and uh we mentioned we said this briefly earlier today but um what's the voice of your organization and what is natural for you to be sharing right um and uh what makes sense what would your patrons expect of you um and to lean on that uh, to continue to build that trust with them so um you know when it comes to uh understanding understanding their feedback, um, you, will, you will know what makes sense to follow up and close the loop with them. Um, you will know when to have further conversations so that you really understand what the need is um, and that then you can evaluate, okay, how can I uh, implement um, and how can I also then uh, let everyone else know, here's, here's another thing that we added because we heard from you um, that this is important. Indeed, I love that. Like getting to say back to our patrons, we heard you, so we made these changes. It reminds me, um, you know, wearing a hat from uh, where I, uh, going back in time, popping in my time machine to a previous role I had before joining TRG at um, a, a performing arts center that also had a school. And we, um, you know, for our, the parents of the music students, we wondered why we were seeing terms of opening up emails. So we got a focus group together to figure out, you know, how we could make those emails more impactful for them. And, um, you know, one of the things we heard loud and clear was, um, you know, I worked all day, we had to make dinner, we had to get the kids to bed, we had to then put the kids back to bed again when they got up, and then we had to put them back because they didn't want to stay. Uh, so I don't have time to read your clever subject lines of your emails. Can you just give me the facts, just the facts? So, you know, the, the copywriter in me, my heart broke a little bit because I loved writing those clever subject lines, but we switched it and said to them, you're right, we're gonna actually give you the facts in the subject line so you can be more efficient in how you were you know, interacting with us and our open rates went up and we literally said we did this because of you. So to have those partnerships is a really important piece of the puzzle. Um, so uh, next question, how often and how should we communicate with patrons when we don't know yet when we'll be, what we'll be able to offer them when we resume our programming? Um, you know, we've retained a lot of revenue, 80% uh, almost, but we've deferred uh, but our deferred could still be vulnerable to refund requests if we don't remind patrons we have kept their investment in mind. So, um, you know, as time goes by and we haven't mentioned things back to them, when should we start having these conversations? Claudia, you're shaking your head, so I'm thinking you have a whole bunch of thoughts on this. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking sooner is better, right? Um, let's not, well, let's not forget about them. Um, being silent uh, might send them that message. Um, but also just thinking about what other offerings do you have? Maybe it's not your programming that they uh, had expected to receive at the end of the uh, 1920 season, but maybe there's um, a special chat with the artistic director um, or other artists that you're still engaged with um, that can provide them value. Um, so again, this goes back to thinking about your uh, loyalty pathway. Um, 
if you, you might not have a paid offering that you uh, have on the table right now, but how can you keep them engaged and let them see, even if uh, your payment has been deferred, we're still going to provide you value. We still want to connect with you. Yeah, indeed. It's the good news is I think in this is um, everyone knows what's going on. There, you know, it would be hard to find somebody who doesn't understand the gravity of the situation that's going on in our world. So for, I think that provides us a little more, I don't want to say slack, that's not the right word, because we don't want to slack off, it's not about that. But being able to say to our patrons, you know, thank you for investing us in this way. We don't know when we're, we're still thinking about our season, we want to be as thoughtful as possible. So we're, we're figuring things out but we know how valuable you are to us. So we've created, as Claudia, you just described, this interim step that keeps you engaged. And here's some special things just for you. So what I, rather than just having websites that say things like we don't know or you know, really detailed stuff that talks about we can't be here because of COVID and here's all the reasons of COVID. Everyone knows, I think, those things. Tell them what you are doing for them and give, you know, it's actually, goes back to our previous question, fill them in on your thought process a bit and be thoughtful that this box of intermission can't be state, get out of that box. Create, even if it's short term, we're gonna have a program for the next three months that does this, or we're gonna do the next six months to keep people engaged. Um, yeah. So next, I'm just gonna scroll down here. Okay. Um, what is the most, oh, this is such a good one and such a hard one. Uh, what is the most effective way to collect audience data at free outdoor concerts? Yeah, so um, when I read this question, I was thinking um, you, just, you can still perhaps purchase a ticket, but with no revenue attached to it, right? Um, I just did this uh, myself the other day that I still had to RSVP in a sense uh, to, to attend an event. Um, and I had to provide some contact information. Um, and the event was free. It ended up actually getting canceled because it was storming and it was an outdoor, uh, thing. And so, uh, yeah. And now they can contact me again to let me know when they, uh, change the date for the event. So that's the, uh, an effective, easy way. And it helps you manage expectations, right? It helps you understand, okay, do I have anybody showing up? Do I, do I have enough space for, for the folks? Um, that's important for you to know as well. Yeah, I underscore those whys of why you want this information. We have a limited capacity. So that's a great reason to have people RSVP. And then you could take the other approach of sweeten the deal. If you RSVP, we're going to send you a special, uh, you know, one-off solo from this musician or, you know, a uh, uh, monologue read by one of the actors, you know, there's some, make it enticing for your patrons um, to do it. And not just enticing with extras, but also how it will make their lives easier. So think through, uh, put yourself in their shoes. So Claudia, I love all those ideas about why and, you know, being ready for the, uh, the rain date so we can tell folks back if there are challenges. Um, so let's get to one more question and then uh, we have some uh, uh, further housekeeping things just to wrap things up. Um, but here, uh, how do we price single tickets to digital product in such a way as not to undercut our subscriber sense of value by not, but not exceed the practical price point that single ticket buyers are willing to pay? Yeah, the science of pricing is such an interesting one and this is a little bit of unchartered territory. But I would recommend using our muscle memory we typically do when we come to singles versus subscription pricing, which is, or really loyalty pricing, is something that has repeat frequency, a uh, packaging, um, should be cheaper than in comparison than buying a single ticket or a one-off. So if I have 10 concerts, um, if I bought that, my per concert uh, average price should be less than if I were to just buy it as a single. So put things in the context of that. The other thing is we're learning so much. So uh, we often will do, do research around what are other, charge, other people charging in our, our market? What are people charging in the industry? And use that as a springboard, but always put it in that context of the loyalty journey. 
Claudia, anything to, yeah. I think no. just to add us to the comp list, maybe. How about that? Um, I think that's a, that's a great answer, Eric. Um, and so I think that's, that's where I would leave it. Excellent. One other just thought is that a lot of these, when you're thinking through these questions, I, from, from my perspective, I think from TRG's perspective, these are really wonderful opportunities to build collaboration inside your organizations. So don't feel like you need to solve this by yourself in marketing or at the executive level. Bring your partners, bring marketing, development, box office, artistic to the table and talk through these because many of these steps you're taking are grounded in our muscle memory, but are also really new. So this gives us a chance to you know, create these new plans with a, a, a perhaps a renewed sense of silo busting and collaboration building within our organizations. So use it as an opportunity to uh, bring the, you know, your, all the big brains of your organizations together. So I'm gonna uh, share my screen back for a moment. Um, so just a couple of things to wrap up and so appreciate you all being here. One is the questions we did not get to, we still will get to them. We will follow up. So feel free to keep submitting. We so appreciate the time and the questions. Um, also, how to stay in touch with TRG. So you've heard we do these TRG 30s every week, usually on Wednesdays. Uh, they're on our website, sign up 30 minutes, really quick in and out. Uh, important strategic ideas. Uh, we have a virtual network on LinkedIn. Please join us. People submit questions there and we answer them as well. And if you'd like to join the benchmark, like I said, it is free. Please do. So go to uh, trgarts.com uh, ben slash benchmark uh, or just on our, our splash page, you'll see the link to get there. So uh, please feel free to join that uh, and you will get access to this data as well um, when you do. So uh, loyalty planning clinics. So if you liked what you heard today and you wanna to try to operationalize some of this in your own organizations, we have two clinics coming up. Uh, these are two day events that think through stewardship, through loyalty and actually have time where you're building plans, usually around one um, event you're doing, one activity to give you a template and plan uh, that you can replicate at your organization. So we have two coming up. Um, we'd love to thank you for uh, participating with us today. And if you were to sign up for one of these, these uh, do have a cost. We'd love to offer you 20% off uh, the registration fee. They're 1500. So, uh, 300 off if you were to sign up. The deadline for the September clinic is August 20th to sign up for that. So if this feels like some area that you want to take action, we'd love to have you. There's a, you know, this is on our website as well. The other thing is some organizations have said to us, we're trying to think about the big picture, even longer planning about engagement and planning around, you know, today. And we know six months from now is going to be even different. So how do we get into our new normals. Uh, so we're creating a cohort of organizations to think through how to do that uh, through a consulting um, relationship with us. So um, I'm gonna pull up, actually I'll go back to that in a second, pulling up our contact information. If you'd like to hear more about joining that cohort, uh, contact us. Um, our email addresses are here, phone number, you'll get our information in uh, the follow-up as well, but uh, and, and we can Eric, help you through that. Because I saw a question, um, that cost that you quoted is per organization participation. That is correct, per organization, yeah. So you can have a few members of your organization join that clinic. So um, indeed, yeah, it's, it's per organization. And then uh, please join us again if you thought this was useful, helpful. We're gonna look at this information, new data points, new tips, uh, building on this in two weeks when we look at building engagement um, through that other lens of cultivation donations. Um, it's a handshake with this, but has some of its own nuance as well. Um, so thank you so much. It was such a joy to be here with you today and uh, be well and let us know you we're here as a resource for you. So uh, feel free to reach out to us with questions, things you need. We're happy to share. And like we said at the beginning, you'll be getting this deck as well and uh, we've recorded it. So thank you so much. Be well and um, have Thanks a great day. Everyone. Yeah.